Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen, fellow colleagues, uh, researchers, and a postgraduate student. We do thank you very much for joining us this morning. As it has been um, indicated, today we will be looking at um, the data analysis plan. So in terms of what uh, will be covered, there will be an introduction just to lay a foundation and we will look at variables since data analysis is all about variables. And then we will also touch on the different um, data analysis levels and the statistical tests that are there. And then we will uh, conclude. So in terms of uh, the data analysis plan, um, a data analysis plan is quite an important document that um, can assist you as a researcher in your journey. So you can look at it as a document um, that is developed by you as a researcher. So you are the one who are to develop the plan and you develop it in, a, in advance because its purpose is to guide you in your data analysis process. So it is a plan. And when you have a plan, a plan is always there to, to guide you. If you do not have a plan, then you're not really sure what you are working towards. You don't know what you want to achieve. So when you have a plan, it will assist you to think about the data that you will be collecting. So you will uh, not just think about it, but have a you know, a thorough way of engaging with the data in your mind and as you plan, putting it down with um, what you really want to collect. And then you can also now uh, thoroughly um, engage on what this data will be used for. Because as you plan, then you will be able to outline why do I actually need to collect this? And then when you answer that question, then you would have answered the purpose as to why do you need to collect um, that uh, uh, that particular data. And the plan is also supposed to answer the question of how will this data be analyzed. So way, way, way before, way ahead, before you even collect your data, while you are still planning your study, this is it's the, the, the right time to actually develop the data analysis plan because it will assist you um, in your journey and it will ensure that um, you actually collect all the data that you need. Because you have a plan, you have written down everything, as you will see that it's very detailed. You'll be able to tick the boxes to say, I have this variable, I'm gonna use it for this, this is how the variable looks like. So you're able to account. And in cases where you find that as you look at your plan, there are some variables that are missing, then you're able to, um, to add them and see how you will measure them. And it will also ensure that, as I've said, you actually collect the data, you know, that you, you need. So you will, there won't be any waste in terms of uh, that you collect um, variables that uh, you're not going to use because for every variable that you will include, you'll be able to actually give an account as to why it is in the plan and how you intend to use it. So it also assists you to ensure that data is collected uh, and structured in such a way that it will yield re reliable results. So because you, you are planning and you are thinking about your variables thoroughly as you put them on paper, not just in your mind, but you are putting them on paper, you can actually see what you have. You can also now, um, you, you will also be able to connect it to the data analysis and your variables. You can put them in such a way that uh, it will work for your study. And uh, because you have all the variables, you will be able to give an account of, of the variables that you are collecting on the plan. 
you also be able to have um, some of the inputs that are required uh, for sample size estimation for certain techniques for certain statistical analysis techniques you need to know the the number of variables that you will be um, collecting and when you don't have a plan you kind of have a rough idea in your mind that i want to study poverty but because you haven't um, uh, interrogated everything critically even as you think about i want to study poverty but you don't really know um you can't if so someone were to ask you um you want to study poverty what are the variables that you are interested in uh, it's not always uh, i have i mean i i've met uh, researchers who are able to actually even if they cannot uh, say it but they can point you to a document to say that these are the variables that i actually and they can even tell you how they want to measure them but it doesn't okay um that often uh, most of the time uh, researchers just sit with the idea of what they want to collect but not having drilled it down you know to the lowest lowest level to the point of saying if i will say i want to call i want to measure this how am i going to measure it and when you prepare for a data analysis when you have a, a data analysis plan to assist you because in the process of developing the plan you have to drill down to your variables and be exactly sure as to uh, what do you want to measure and how so what what should this plan contain because your your your, your research is guided by the research questions then the plan has to have um, the research questions so i've skipped the first level that you have the papers but the research questions are the things that at the end if all your research questions all the quantitative research questions because in this case i'm i'm addressing quantitative um issues so you need to list all your quantitative um research questions or objectives once you've listed them so for each objective then you need to be able to say what are the variables that are required for me to actually um, measure that objective and then you address it and you you deal with all the variables and then you move on to the second objective and you do the same exercise where you unpack uh, the variables that are required uh, for you to actually um, realize or respond to that question so you would do that for all your your research questions and as you are doing that um, you need to also take into account your inclusion your exclusion criteria sometimes when you read the questions there will be sometimes they can uh, give you an idea of the, um, the, the the criteria so maybe it's gonna say postgraduate students the question maybe will have something about postgraduate students but then even with that you need to define uh, postgraduate students for your study uh, is does it include um, for example honors and postgraduate diploma students or when you say postgraduate students are you only talking about masters and um, and doctoral students so even the uh, the the population becomes it becomes important for you to actually delineate as to when you say you want you are looking at this population um what are the parameters you know how uh, how what is the inclusion and the exclusion criteria and it has to have the variables that will be used in the analysis here we say main analysis but ideally all the variables that you will use in the analysis whether it's going to be uh, a, an outcome a dependent variable a variable that you will use for stratification and it is actually it helps quite a lot if you 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 do have a plan because you you're able to actually uh, interrogate what every variable what it, what it, the role of every variable in your study for example if you have a variable that you want to use to stratify um then you'll be able to identify that variable or those variables and 
when you do your sampling, you will also then be able to um to implement that stratification and you will not be surprised at the end because when you stratify you are trying to ensure that the different groups are represented um uh, properly such that you, you stratify and maybe you want at the end to do some comparisons and sometimes if you don't stratify you will find that uh, because you 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 looked at everyone as a group, you didn't ensure that you have enough sample within the different groups. So when you do your plan, you are also able to accommodate um things like that. And some in other cases, perhaps you don't want to stratify, but you also want to do, uh, as I've said, comparison. Yes. And some populations, you find that certain groups within your bigger populations, they are small, such that you actually have to oversample uh, in, those, um, in those groups. So when you don't specify what you want to do with every variable, you, you sometimes miss out on that. And you find that a data analysis phase, when you have already collected the data, uh, you didn't collect enough sample for those groups because they are small groups if you just treat them as a group you will come back with a small sample but when you are aware what you what you want to do at the end you are able to then say this i know it's a small group i'm gonna oversample as i say so it it actually fits in even into the other um the other processes of your study which ultimately ensure that uh your results are reliable. You know, you've followed sound um, and theoretically uh, correct um, approaches, that is statistically. So I think it also um, it just outlines the, important, the importance of having such a plan because the plan is like you, you take yourself to the end goal. When you do a data analysis plan, you think about the end. And then you can work backwards. You, 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 this is what I want. And then you can now fill in the gaps as to say, since this is what I want, how am I going to achieve this? Then you fill in all the other methodological issues. Um, as you will see, it will maybe influence also the, the design of your study, what kind of a, of a design and the kind of data, col uh, data collection method based on what you want to achieve. And because you have clarity and you've actually put it on paper, you are able to say, yes, this is what I want. And then how can I get to this point? So, so you're able to list the variables that you are going to collect. And you are also able to say, once I've collected these variables, some of the variables I'm not gonna collect directly. I'm going to derive them from what I've collected. And you, you outline how they will be derived. And you also outline the role, as I've indicated, the role of each variable that you will be um, collecting data from. And very, very important is also the description of the scale of measurement and the attributes. So this is very important because it's a, um, it's 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 something that's very critical for data analysis the scale once you understand your variables then it's going to assist you to be able to select uh, the correct uh, data analysis even before you do the data analysis because you understand your data what you will be collecting even as you are planning you are also able to say this is how i plan to analyze it. So the scales of measurement for each variable you have to outline as you will see as we proceed. And then it must also talk about the data sets. So if you how if you're going to be collecting um, the pri primary data, you will list all the variables, right? And if um, you're going to be using existing data sets, then you also identify um, those data sets that you will be um, using, which will now be secondary data. And because you know you'll be using secondary data, it also now gives you an opportunity because you need to um, 
have clarity about your variables, then you need to interrogate that secondary data to understand what are the variables that are there in that um, in that um, database, whatever source that you will be using. And what was the primary purpose of the data? How was this data collected? You know, the design, the methods, and the variables, are they measured the way that you want to use them as, as you conceive your study? The variables that are in the, uh, the, the secondary data, have they been measured the way you want to actually uh, measure those particular attributes? Maybe you might find that this variable is measured in a particular way and you had conceived it um, a different way. Um, for example, let's maybe talk about, maybe you want to talk about um, well-being. And maybe in the data set, they have measured subjective well-being, where the people um, were asked to actually uh, kind of classify themselves as to the different levels of well-being. So they it's based on how they perceive themselves. So it's it's subjective. But in your conception of the study, you didn't really want to use um, subjective measurement. You intended to use another measurement of well-being. And then because you can see that this um, secondary data is measuring it a different way to what you you wanted, how you wanted to do it, then you can make a decision to say, do you proceed and you use the subjective measure as a proxy or no, it's not going to work. And then you ignore this secondary data and you go back uh, to uh, to plan again with a mind now of collecting primary data. So this planning is, is, is actually very important because it ensures that you're not surprised, you know, there are no surprises along your journey. Yes, things will not be perfect, but you do uh, as much as you can to to plan so that you don't just um, go about it without any plan and everything is a surprise. So we just we want to try and avoid surprises because once you've collected the data, so much has been spent and so much can be time can be money, you know, and maybe other resources such that you know you cannot go back. So we just have to salvage, you know, work with what you've collected and we are just making things, you know, trying to just ensure that there is something that, you know, you can put together. But that's not what we want, because if you have a plan, then you'll be able, even when things are not working out, you can always go back to the plan and be able to say, this I won't be able to achieve, and how does it affect my study? And if, if I mean, you can still move with that, then you continue, but you are already aware of the things that you will not be able to achieve, the things that you need to change. It doesn't hit you at the end. And the format of the data, uh, maybe the data, yes, this is also very important, because sometimes the data, if it's secondary data, the data has been um, captured in a format that is maybe foreign to you or a format that requires a certain software for it to, to be converted to what you can use. You have to think about those things as to, do you have the resources? If it requires a certain software, will you have access to that software? Uh, sometimes when we say these things, it's like it's just theory, but uh, the reality is this is what we encounter daily as we work with researchers. I can talk about a recent case where um, the, uh, the, the researcher at some point, they needed to use um, data uh, from states say, and the data comes in a certain format. It is uh, this is in the geography um, space. So the data, the file that they are sending, it comes in a certain format. And the res researcher, I couldn't open it, even though I was also given access as I was assisting the researcher with the sample. So the researcher had to, uh, the researcher didn't have the software, but at least uh, they had, because at least they are also in that space, 
within their office they could get assistance but you just imagine if they didn't have access then it means you have to purchase maybe because at that point your study has advanced uh, because we were doing sampling you've done so much literature review so maybe you just have to purchase the software and maybe it's a cost that you didn't plan for so those kind of things you can avoid them or you can plan for them um if you you actually plan uh, for your data analysis and unpack everything such that you will know what will be required for every variable and if you if if it's actually feasible for you to um achieve that and then also if it's secondary the permission interrogate that as to whether um, permission is required and uh, with secondary data the other thing is that uh, the other challenge is that sometimes permission is given because um, at a high level within that particular institution the owner of of the secondary data they have proper channels you know for researchers to request for permission so when they look at your document everything is in place they give you permission but you can have experience challenges when now the right department now now you have the the permission and you are you also have ethical clearance from the university and you now want the data and you when you send it to the now you have to send it to the relevant department when you send when you communicate with the relevant department you find that they give you um eh, challenges they're not responding to your emails and all those things so those are some of the things that you need to think about with a secondary data that yes i can have permission but uh will you be able in, in should you encounter problems do you know anyone within the organization who can assist you all those things um sometimes yeah we don't think about them but sometimes you do encounter those challenges and then some data sets are weighted you need to be aware of that because that is going to influence your data analysis how the data will be analyzed if you also want to take into account the weights then that is going to reflect in your data analysis plan and softwares are not the same some softwares are powerful with weighted data some have so that also comes into play that's why it's important to understand your data and then you can link it with uh, the resources that you have that i want to use spss to analyze my data can i do this kind of analysis in spss or even though i'm not doing it for myself if i'm going to be assisted seeing that unisa um, gives us access to spss will the people who are assisting me be able to do this in spss can it be done in spss that's the big question that's why it's important because if you don't know that your data is weighted how else will you know that um, you need to use a, a certain technique that uh, takes into account that the data is weighted so i think another key thing here that is highlighting the importance of this plan and also how many observations because sometimes you have secondary data and um, you find that the data is, is is small you know when you actually check it uh, for um a, a, to check whether it's uh, it's sufficient you find that it's small but if you don't uh, look into that you will not know at the end when you actually are now saying i'm ready to collect the data i'm ready to use the data you find that the data is is quite small for what you intend to do so I've already indicated that does it have all the variables, right? If you are doing, you are collecting data for yourself, you are the one who is making those decisions. So you you can, you don't have to go through this, but this is for if you are using secondary data and you can talk about how, 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 how recent is this data, you know? Is the data dated or can it still be used, you know? If you find that the data is um, is too old, 
uh, and you can also, I mean, be able to say how old is old. And then you can be able to make a decision because maybe it's data that is not um, updated uh, frequently such that when you want to use it, it's it's it, it doesn't work for what you want to do because it's um it's old and you need to if it's data that was collected through an instrument you need to get the instrument and look at the instrument also request for a code book a code book will outline all the variables how they were coded how things were computed if there are things that are computed you it's gonna also explain how variables are computed and then with that understanding, you'll be able to make a decision to say, yes, for the variables that I want, it can work or it, it might not work. And it must also, your plan must also talk about the, the statistical methods that you're going to be using and the software, uh, as I've indicated, uh, softwares are different. Sometimes researchers are doing specialized things that, uh, you, you find that a certain software is powerful in those things, while another one is just very basic. So maybe it's not able to do uh, those kind of analysis. So yeah, you need to also think about that uh, because I, I suppose as you conceive the study and you see as you read, you can see how this data, the kind of statistics that they talk about, and they will also talk about the, um, the software and you'll be able to say whether you do have access to that particular software or not. For example, um, uh, like in the in the past few years, there is this um, uh, a package, um, a smart PLS, which is used for structural equation modeling, but um, the partial least squares. So it's a package. That package, uh, I'm not sure when it was introduced, but I came to know about it around 2017, 2016. And I, I had a, 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 a researcher who had collected data and they wanted to use that package. And the package is not free. It is, um, you, you buy the package, right? And the institution didn't have license for the package. So I couldn't assist the researcher using that package. The researcher had already collected data, but I couldn't assist. Fortunately, I did um, I check and I found that uh, we could do the same thing using R and R is free. But uh, had, had I not found R, I would not have been able to assist the researcher. The researcher would have had to go and actually buy the package and maybe, I don't know, do it for themselves because I don't have it. If I have to um, go through the package and familiarize myself with the package, I need to have it. So unless if the researcher was going to be coming uh, and yeah, camping or maybe, you know, it was that kind of a situation. So I'm just trying to bring out the fact that sometimes the um, analysis that you want to do, uh, you find that it's specialized and it requires certain packages. Sometimes those packages, they are new or those packages are, are, are used in certain fields, you know, predominantly in certain fields such that you're not going to find them, that everyone has them. And that can be a limitation. You have to think about, I require support. I require support, but I cannot be supported because this package is not available. I can buy it, but the person who's supposed to support me doesn't have it. So there are those things that um, you need to think about. And having a plan will assist you to, to actually think about that and to make a decision as to whether you proceed if you proceed, then you'll also have a plan as to say, uh, maybe I will go externally and find someone who can assist me. They should be, and for example, with that smart uh, PLS, there is a, um, what you call a trial version, but you know with trial versions, it's got limitations. Sometimes I have seen that it you find that the trial version, it works for the researcher. Um, but then I can't, you can't support the researcher because um, 
I've I've already done my trial. You know, I've used it. I can't. They, it's not going to allow me to to trial again. But at least you can show the researcher. But the challenge is because you don't have the package, you don't engage with it um, that often. So you you used it whenever. With this example of the smart PLS, obviously it's no longer a problem because as it was still a new thing. But now the softwares have most softwares do have packages to actually um, do that thing. And then finally. Your plan needs to have what I'm, I, I say is table shelves. So your plan needs to, when you look at the plan, someone who's looking at the plan will have an idea of what will be presented in, in, the, in the data analysis chapter. So the plan must also have table shelves. The table shelves will um, have the variables and you will see that it is a shell, it's a table, but it's empty because it doesn't have numbers. But you can see this table is meant to demonstrate this and that, or it's meant to capture X, Y, and Z. So you're able to say, this is what I'll be presenting, and you are able to say, no, it's not enough. No, it's not what I want. No, it's too much. Or no, I need to add more variables because you can see you can have a picture of how your data analysis chapter is going to look like because it's just shells, it's just table. They are not necessarily um, a, a developed for the final uh, document, but in terms of um, what it, what needs to be captured, the table has that. It just that doesn't have figures, but it's got if it's percentages. It will show I want percentages for this variable. If it's averages, it will show for these variables I want to present the average, I want to present the standard deviation, I want to present the mean, I want to present the maximum, whatever you want to present. So you can see that it forces you to really engage um, with your variables and to actually know what you are doing which is very good that uh, as a researcher, you actually know what you are doing. You might not be sure. I mean, if let's say you say I'm going to use a t-test because maybe you haven't done it in your mind, it might not like be very, very clear, but you will know that a t-test is when I want to compare two groups because when you put the t-test, you even also check that, okay, in this study, they did a t-test. What is what what are they reporting when they they do a t test? What were the variables uh, uh, which were used to do the t test? Then you can see, OK, to do a t test, I need a, a variable that has two groups and I want to see how those two groups differ in terms of a numeric variable. And then you, you see that you OK, you see, OK, I also have a, a, a numeric variable. It means I must do a t test. You haven't done a t-test, but you already know. In essence, you know a t-test compares a, a continuous variable between two groups, independent groups or dependent groups. So you can you can see that it takes you so so much further, and um, you you in a position to actually talk about um, your study and talk about what uh, you want to do and how. Confidently, because you've even put it on paper, you've uh, interrogated it. So you're not copying things that you are seeing from other people and just pasting them. Because you have to think about your variables, even as you paste things, you have to check if they will work. How do you check? You have to interrogate your own variables. I think I need to move. So yeah, having laid that foundation, so the, the shells, you will have the shells for the first part, your analysis, your new univariate, your bivariate. If you are going to doing a bi, bi means two, uni means one. If you're doing multiple variable analysis, you will also have the, the shells for, for that kind of an analysis. If you're going to do multivariate, then you also have table shells for, for that. So 
when you do the plan, the plan without variables, you can't have plan a plan because when you collect data and what you are analyzing the data is it's it's the variables, right? So that is your starting point. Yes, you know uh, the research questions, but you have to move now from the research questions to um, a point where you can now measure the variables that will talk to those research questions. So variables are attributes and those attributes, we use them to describe, um, we can describe people, you can describe a thing and you can describe an idea. So I can describe a person using uh, their age, right? I can describe a person using their level of education. I can describe an idea. Maybe I can call it um, knowledge of something. I can describe a place, its province. So when we collect data, we measure variables, attributes, attributes of interest. And because you are collecting from different units of observations, sometimes they are the same such that you find that if you ask me, you find that I'm a, a, a master's uh, student and the other person is a master's student. When you go to the next person, they are a PhD student. So it, it can vary. Those variables, um, they have roles right in your research. There will be this variable. Sometimes it's one variable. Sometimes it's more than one variable, which is your interest, the outcome. So we say it's the dependent variable or the response variable. This is the variable that you are interested in. And these other variables can come in as uh, the variables that are independent. You want to see how they are related to this variable that you are interested in. So you will have a, a, a dependent variable. A dependent variable will be your focus, your key variable of interest. And then you can have other variables that you want to see how um, they, um, they are related to this uh, outcome variable or the response variable. If it's, a, if it's a, 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 an experimental study, as a researcher, you can manipulate um, the, the independent variable, right? You can be able to say, um, I want to look at um, the, the, the concentration. So I want to compare when it's this concentration, when I give my plants this amount of um, a plant food, what happens? That's the, the what happens will be the outcome. Well, as opposed to when I give it this concentration of plant food. So as a researcher, you are able to manipulate this independent variable, which is um, the, the, the different levels of concentration of the plant food. But in other cases, you are not able to manipulate the independent variable. For example, if um, your independent variable is gender, if you want to look at um, um, the amount of alcohol consumed and you are comparing male, you are comparing them by gender. You can not assign people to a gender. So you can not say I'm going to give these people this gender, give this group this gender as you do with the other example where you say these plants, I will give them this concentration of the plant food. This group, these plants, I'm going to give them this concentration and, and so on and so on, depending on the different levels that you, you want to vary. With a, if you have a, an independent variable that is a gender as an independent variable, you can't say you take, you take the persons and you say, I assign this one at this gender, I assign this one that, that gender. The gender is inherent in them. So it's it's an independent variable, but you are not able to manipulate it, but you actually just uh, observe. So even being aware of your the type of variables that you are working with will also assist you with the design because you will know that my variables, I cannot manipulate them. And as such, uh, I can't do um, an experimental design since I don't have control. 
as a researcher. Okay, so moving on now to you, we've spoken about that you, you need to um, identify your variables because data analysis is about variables. So if you don't know your variables, you, you can't do any data analysis or you will mix up your things. You will uh, measure things incorrectly because you haven't uh, clearly um, listed the variables and you haven't clearly outlined how they are going to be measured. So in line with the purpose of the study, you will have your, your research questions, the things that you want to answer. What do we want to know in the study? What are the sp specific research questions we want to answer? Those uh, specific re re research questions, you need to list them as I've indicated. You list all of them. And from each research question, you need to um, now be able to extract variables. And I will show you an example of how you can actually go through that. So you need to extract the variables that you need to measure for you to be able to respond to that research uh, um, uh, question. So you do that for all the research questions. You say, from this question, what is it that I want to know? And what are the key variables that I can measure which are going to assist me to, to know this thing that I want to know? And the research questions will also assist you when you list them. They will assist you to have a structured approach, which is what with people who um, use questionnaires. That's the process that we follow when we review your questionnaire. We go to the objectives. For each objectives, our, our, each objective, we will ask you, this is the objective. Uh, how are you addressing it in the questionnaire? Take us to that part that is addressing this. And, and we can be able to now see how you are addressing it. And uh, we can see if what you've put talks to the research um, a question that you've put across. And as you say, this is how you're going to respond to it. I mean, when you say this is how you're going to respond to it, you are using variables to respond to it. Those variables, you need to account for them and locate them in your field and within the theory. Some things are easy. If we talk about age, it's just age, but age can also be used in different ways. But there are certain variables that can be defined uh, in more than one way. So you need to say, I have this variable and this is how I'm going to measure it. This measurement is informed by this and you will use um, the literature to support the approach that you are taking. So I advise if you are doing a questionnaire, you need to account for all the variables. When I say account, you must be able to take uh, people back to the literature to say, this is how I arrived at measuring this variable this way. It can be measured in many ways, especially when things can be measured in more than one way. You have to take uh, uh, the reader through how you arrived at that particular measurement that you are using and how it is suitable for your study. So for every variable, you need to account, especially the variables that can be measured in more than one way. And then those variables, um, they also give us a window. We can now think about the type, the type of data analysis um, that is possible. And we now also have an idea, once you list the variables, we have an idea of uh, what we will be collecting. So as an example, so if the study was about, um, you, you, the purpose of the study is to analyze knowledge about current affairs. So that's the purpose, actually. You want to uh, analyze knowledge around uh, current affairs of UNISA students and you've explained whatever why you are looking at that why that is a purpose why 
there's a gap. You've done all that groundwork and you've arrived at this point. And then now you outline the specific research questions that you are going to uh, address that will enable you to address that the main purpose. So for example, I've used uh, three uh, um, examples of the research questions that you could have. You could have what is the level of knowledge of current affairs of students at UNISA? So that's one question. You want to know the level of knowledge. And when you say students, that's now the population is coming in. Students, is it the entire UNISA student community or are you excluding, not excluding, right? And then when you look at the, the question, as I've said, for you to now try to see the variables, you now need to highlight the concepts that are captured by that question. Highlight concepts that are captured by that question. So for example, I've highlighted knowledge and the knowledge is about current affairs. And I should also have highlighted level because it's important. You are saying, um, what is the level? So you want to, when you are reporting, you want to talk about level of knowledge. You will be able to tell us the level of knowledge is, you'll be able to describe it because you want the level of knowledge. So even level should have been um, highlighted. And then there is a student. It's something to also take note of. The second one, we are looking at what? A relationship. And then I think even the relationship, I should have highlighted all this relationship. And then the age, the knowledge again, and we also current affairs. And then we can look at other variables as well. So for each um, a specific research question, you highlight uh, key concepts that um, you can use to now take it to the next level to um, come up with the variables. So here you now, based on these concepts that you've highlighted, you must define the variables. I suppose the the relationship I didn't highlight it because you don't need to use them to 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 define the variables. You just need to use them to when you think about the statistics. Then this a key word relationship will now come back to say what are we looking for and then which test can we use because we are looking for a relationship but in the context of actually defining your variables you don't really need uh, this word relationship uh, that's why it's not highlighted they will come in handy when you now take it a, 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 the next step and you talk about the stats yes so i've already given this so what is important is the last bullet that some attributes are easy to measure. For example, um, age. I ask you and you give me the age. And some can be observed directly. Others are subjective. And we also have those that are measured as constructs. So you need to be aware of this so that you can treat your variables uh, pro uh, properly. So as an example, um, we pick up from um, these keywords that I highlighted, but I'm only going to use the first one, which is knowledge of current affairs. I suppose when we talk about age, you can define age to say you are going to collect it. I think you will see. And the, uh, the field of study, the level of study, you can um, describe them to say, when you say level of study, you mean whether the person is um, doing a master's or PhD, or are you asking if the person is doing the first year of master's, second year of master's, first year of PhD? So even that you can um, outline and, and actually um, describe to say, when you say field, these are the different fields. When you talk about level, this is um, what you mean. So first you identify the concept. So you had a concept, we said knowledge of current affairs. Um, and then from that a conceptual definition, you have to now 
come up with an operational definition. So the operational definition is um, how the concept will be measured. And the, the conceptual definition is just um, how this, 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 uh, this variable is to be measured or observed in a study. So if I talk about current affairs, it's just an interpretation of what is current affairs. And then operationally, even current affairs will have a, a, a definition, but then I will say operationally, this is how I'm going to measure it. So it talks to the variable that I'm going to be uh, collecting. So the example we are using here is knowledge of current affairs. So you have three options here. These are examples. I'm not saying this is the only way, but it's just to show you that you can ask factual questions, right? So you can ask your um, the students about um, recent events that have been in the media that have been dominating the news that have been dominating um, uh, in the media space, and you can ask them. You can have a reference period, right, where you say, "I'll look at uh, the past six months, whatever the past week." You will decide. You will decide on that reference period and you will motivate as to why you are using uh, the past week, why you are using the past month. When they when you 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 look at what is dominating um, in the media space, when you say I'm gonna focus on the past month, the news that are um, that have been um, circulating in the past month, you will also provide a motivation. Why am I looking at a month? Why am I looking at the past seven days? And then based on those um, key things that have been in the media, then you formulate questions and you ask uh, the, the students and then they respond and then you, you score them. And based on the score, you'll be able to say whether they actually have knowledge or they don't have knowledge. So, and then you can also say, you can ask a question in the questionnaire you ask them about consumption so you can also use consumption as a proxy obviously it's not a uh, hundred percent but let's say you were using um secondary data and that secondary data doesn't have it's not going to have maybe the questions but maybe in the secondary data there's a question that asks about how often people um watch the news or read the news or listen, whichever mode, but there's a question that taps into frequency and you are using that frequency as a proxy. Yes, it doesn't mean that um, they retain what they have been consuming or what they are reporting to have been consuming, but you can use it as a proxy, right? For, for, for to say, if people consume uh, um, the news, um, frequently, you expect them to, uh, their knowledge to be higher than those who uh, consume it uh, less frequently or who don't consume at all. So that would be a proxy. And then you can also have a question where it's now perceptions, right? How they perceive themselves. So it's the same thing that you are measuring, knowledge of current affairs, but you can see that you can measure it in different ways. Here, it's um, how they perceive, perceive they, themselves in terms of knowledge. So they classify this, uh, themselves. They can say they have their knowledge level is excellent. You know, I classify myself, or I can say, ah, no, I'm very, uh, I, I don't really know much about current affairs. So, or my my knowledge level, I can say it's good. I can say it's average. So it's them. And you also have to be aware. I think this is also important that the last one, it's it's about how they perceive themselves. So you can't really say when you, this objective doesn't really measure knowledge. It's perceived knowledge. It's how they perceive themselves. The other one, the first one, because you are asking them questions, you can say it's measuring knowledge. But the second one, the last one, it's perceived, how they perceive themselves. And I mean, I can I can consider myself to, to be a very average, but you might find that if they give me the score 
I mean, the, 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 the knowledge questions, I actually perform uh, better than I've rated myself. So the perceived um, measurement, uh, you cannot say it's the same as the actual. So I think also very important when you do your variables and when you do your questions, think about whether are you measuring the actual behavior or the actual or the perceived? I need to move. And another example is stress. If you're going to measure stress, you can use those questions whereby um, they, um, you know, they ask you several questions. It's a validated instrument. They ask you about symptoms of stress and they score you and say your stress level is at this level nine. Uh, maybe you have um, what uh, medium and the different levels of stress. You can measure it maybe looking at um, your um, other measures, maybe uh, your heart rate, the variability of your heart rate. You're going to need a, a device, right, to do that. Uh, they can also measure brain waves. And then they can also measure concentration of hormones. So when you say I want to, you 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 have a variable stress. You have to think now how am I going to measure it for my study, and then um, the how will be influenced by a lot of things, right? Whether you are able to tap into these other things, whether you are using a questionnaire, do you have the instruments? So. It's very important that you've put it down. Then you think about how you are going to do it. That is going to help you. Then you also know um, how it's going to look like. For example, if you measure it as um, if you you measure using a validated instrument, it's going to come as um, you've got what not stress at all, medium stress. Uh, I can think of the other levels of stress, very stressed. So it's going to be a category. And if you use the other measurements, it's going to come as, as a number, a value. You can still categorize if you want to report it as categorized. So the how also influences how it's going to look like. And then the age. So you can, let's say in your study, you have age as a variable, but how you want to use it. You want to use it in terms of the different age generations, the millennials, the, the baby boomers, whichever definition you want to use. If you if in the questionnaire you or if it's measured as a categorical, you have to ensure that those categories align to the different generations that you want to use. Because if the data is already collected, you can't as a category. You won't be able to change it to align. So that's why even though it's age, it's simple. When you think about how you want to use it, you now say, no, it's OK as age. I will collect it as age in years, or I will collect it as a category. And then I will specify the category, maybe the generations. If you are not sure with age, you can ask it in years. and. During data analysis, as you continue, maybe you, you will have more clarity as to how you want to use it. Some variables you don't have the leisure or the liberty to leave them open. You have to decide um, on the onset how you want to use them and collect them correctly. And then quickly, I'm going to go through this. OK, oh, because it's uh, in the. Um, it's showing it's not uh, picking up. So I'm going to use this one as the last example. I hope you can see a uh, poverty as well. If you have poverty, for example, even poverty, people can um, give you what they think. You can use a subjective measure where people tell you that uh, they perceive themselves to be very poor, not poor to be average, whatever, the different levels that uh, you will uh, you will put and they can select uh, uh, where they think they fall. So it's based on how they perceive themselves. And you can have other measures of poverty. You can use the poverty lines 
which is maybe based on them. You can, there's the food poverty line and that food poverty line will say whether you are poor or not poor. So it's binary. It's, it's, you, you've got two responses. You are either poor or not poor. So when you use the poverty lines, you will come back with a classification. That classification is going to be two things. You are poor, not poor, depending on whether you are below or above that cutoff point. And you are aware now that, okay, this outcome poverty, it has two levels. It's a category. It means when I think about data analysis, I have to look at data analysis techniques that take into account that the outcome, the, the dependent variable is a category. Then if you look at the second one, it's, a, it's like an index, right? It, it uses different indicators. It takes into account the health, the education, the living standards, economic activity, and then it outlines. So you can even think, so that's why sometimes I even ask when you have these things that you think you're going to use, you also have to think, do they have equal weight health? Does it have the same weight as um, education? So you can see based on this, this one that is being used, the one that I've put here, it is a South African one. They've got different weights, right? Child mortality has 25%. Even the different indicators, they have different weights, you can see. And you, you also have to think now, for example, these ones that are here, they are household. So it's looking at poverty at a household level. That's how it has been um, a, a designed. So for yourself, you now also have to think, when I am measuring this poverty, was I thinking household? What was I thinking? So that if you adopt this, you know that it's going to work because you were also thinking household. So these are small things that sometimes you can miss because you, you sometimes you just assume because it's talking about poverty, it will work for my study, but you miss the in-between things and you find that at the end, um, there is a misalignment between what you wanted and what you have. And at the time, at that time, you've already collected. So we have to go back maybe sometimes and revise some of your objectives so that what you have uh, can work. So planning avoids are that. So you see with this one, this poverty, you get a score at the end. Depending on these different indicators, you will get a, a score. And you can see things don't have the same weight. Asset ownership, the type of the house that you live in, they don't have the unemployment. It's one of the, the dimensions. It doesn't have the same weight as health and the, the other ones. And at the end, you get a score. And even with this one, you can have a binary. You see, there is a score here where if you score 33% and more, that household is classified to be living in poverty. I need to move. Yes. So I've, I've actually used that um, knowledge about current affairs to try and assist you to say, you, you look at your research questions and you highlight um, the concepts. Some things are straightforward. As I've said, it's age, it's age. Some things you now have to think, I have work engagement. How am I going to measure work engagement? Then you go back to your theory and you look at the different measurements and you select the one that will work for your study. That's the approach. And you put it down. Now you document and you say, this is how I'm going to measure work engagement. These are the dimensions. These are the indicators. As you saw with this poverty thing, you had a dimension, which is education. Then under education, there are some indicators. And then at the end, uh, there is a score and it tells you how to compute the score. That's also important because sometimes the researchers, they will say, I want to measure work engagement. Then they say, I'm going to use this questionnaire. But because some articles don't specify how uh, the, the questionnaire was used, and you find that that's the article that you read and you, you take it. But when we ask you, okay, you have these things, how are you going to use them together now? 
to measure this work engagement, you don't know because when you go to this article, so when the article doesn't specify, you have to, um, you look at other ones that have uh, uh, approached it the same way, and you also ask uh, the, the 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 writers, the authors, to give you more information so that when you adopt it, you already know how you are going to use it. It can't be that when you have collected data, here is this beautiful data, it has been collected. Then we ask how, because I'm not a work engagement specialist. You must tell me as a researcher in that area, how do we, how does this thing work? You have vigor, you have absorption. How must we use this dimension? Do they have the same weight? You need to understand um, your variables and how you are going to use them. And then once you have the variables, then you have to now um, identify the type, the variable type to say, is this variable a, a new a number? Is it a category? And then that will also feed in into the data analysis method that can be used. So in terms of that, we have two types of uh, measurements broadly. We have uh, qualitative and we have quantitative. So this is the way how we actually um, variables um, are defined. The qualitative talks about the type. So when uh, uh, you have a variable that is qualitative, it's a variable that uh, such that when we describe it, we can describe it in the form of a type. So hair color, it's a type. So once you talk about a type, you must know that this variable is qualitative. We are interested in the, um, the quality, not the quantity, but the quality. What kind? When we talk about your level, it's a type. Are you doing PhD? Are you doing masters? It's a type. So when your variable is capturing types, it's categorical because it's going to have the different types, which is the different levels or the different categories. On the other hand, we have variables that when we measure them, um, we describe them in terms of numbers. So when you have measured that variable, what you come back with is a number. So your example are your weight. Those are things that can be counted or measured or weight using a, a unit and it can be recorded. So if I ask you how old are you, I'm going to come back with what? A number. If I ask you in what age group, you see now age group is a type is a type, but if I ask you how old are you, I come back with a number, that variable is going to be numeric or quantitative. If I ask you your weight, you give me your weight, it is a, um, a number. If you, we ask you your income and you give us as a figure, it's a number, but if you, we say what is your income category, it's now a type. We want to know if you are in the lower category, middle, upper category, depending on the categories. What is important is that variables that are qualitative or categorical, you they are not numbers, they are types. So you cannot, when we add, we add numbers. So that has to be very, uh, 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 it must just stick there, that when a variable is a type, it's not a number, it doesn't talk about, a number, it talks about a type, and you cannot add. You can only add things when there are numbers. So you can add hair color green plus hair color red plus hair color yellow. No, you can't add religion X plus religion Y and religion. Once you can add, you can compute an average. That is very important. Once you can add, those things, there is no way you will get an average. So you must know that qualitative, categorical, you cannot add, therefore no averages. 
when we talk about them, we, we talk about, I have 20 of this type, 15 of this type, and then I can convert that into a percentage. Within that, we've got two types. We've got nominal, we've got ordinal. Nominal, it's the types that don't have an order, like hair color. You can say yellow is number one, brown is number two, blonde is number three. You can order them. Then we have these types that we can order, like cancer stage. You can say stage four, stage one, stage two. Stage four, it's the, the most severe. So you can order. When you look at that um, variable, the different levels, the different types, they have order. You can rank them and you can say this one, they earn more if it's income group than the other ones. On the other hand, we have continuous, we have discrete. This side, we talk about numbers. So you can actually uh, use mathematical operations because there are numbers, we can add them. Once we can add them, it means we can compute an average. So I say we have continuous, we have discrete. The difference between continuous and discrete is that discrete is a whole number. So when we talk about the number of people who are attending today, it's a whole number, it's 20. It's not 20.5, 20.3. You cannot have a half a percent. So when I talk about things that we count, it's the, we say they are discrete number of uh, positive um, COVID-19 cases, right? It's a whole number. Then the continuous ones are the ones that can assume a decimal. We talk about weight. It can have a decimal and the other ones that are listed here. Within the quantitative, the numerical, we also have a further classification where we have interval and we have ratio. Both of them, they are numerical. It's just that there is an a, a, a additional layer to them. Interval, in terms of the attributes, the distance between the data elements can be determined. And you can also determine even for the ratio. So you can de determine the distance between um, 20 years and 30 years, right? The difference is 10. And even if I look at 30 and 40, the interval that I skipped is the same and they have the same meaning. So 20 and 30, that difference of 10 years has the same meaning as the difference between 30 and 40 years. That's what we mean when we say the intervals have got the same interpretation. These are the attributes of the um, numerical variables. The only difference between a ratio and interval is that an interval does not have a true zero point whereas the ratio has a true zero point. A true zero point means that um, the absence, when that, that variable has a value of zero, it doesn't mean that um, that attribute does not exist. With a ratio, when it's got a value, a ratio, a ratio scaled variable, when the value is zero, it means that the attribute does not exist. So for example, if you, your salary is zero, you, we can say you don't earn anything, right? But if you look at temperature, if the temperature is zero, the temperature is still there. We can't say that there is no temperature. It's still there. It's just that the value is zero. So that's what we mean by a true zero point. Interval does not have a true zero point. Ratio has a true zero point. Otherwise, all the other attributes are the same. and because of this, you will see that with the ratio, you can um, you can look at uh, you can multiply and say if someone is 40 years, they are at twice as old as someone who is 20 years. So you can multiply, but you can't do the same with an interval. If it's 40 degrees Celsius, you can't say it's twice as hot as when it's 20. So that's the the distinction there. And then uh, in terms of the example, we go back to that example of knowledge of current affairs. If we are looking at factual, remember we spoke about three measurements. If we are looking at um, factual, 
it's going to be a score, right? Which is numerical, that's a type. So I'm getting to the example of the types. And if we convert the type to categories, maybe we say from if you get between this and that, it means that you have um, little knowledge. If you get between this and that, you've got average knowledge. If you get between this, your knowledge is very good. Between that and that, it's excellent. It's going to be a category. And you can see that this category has a rank because excellent means you know better than the other ones. So once we categorize it, we cannot uh, use it uh, in terms of summarizing in terms of the means because we can add categories. I've indicated that category is a type you can add. Once you can add, you can do operations. If we use it as a score, we can do operations, meaning you can think about everything. The test that I used for averages, you can think about them. So once you put your variable, you say this is how I'm going to measure it and how you're going to use it at the end. Then you put a type. You know, because my type is a number, I'm going to be able to compute the average. So I can think about statistical tests that are applicable to an average. No, I don't want to use it as a number. I want a category. I want to see excellent, very good, average, poor. Then I have a category. It means that whatever I think about, it has to be categorical and it must also take into account the fact that there is order. If we use frequency, we agree it's, it's an example of a category because it's going to be once a week, twice a week, you know, once a month, whatever the right category. And it's going to also be ordinal because we have never, we have once a week, twice a week, three times a week. Yes. If it's per week, then we can have the different. And then at the end, maybe we'll have every day, right? And the every day, they consume more than everyone else. So there is order. And then if it's perceived, you can also see that perceived has order. Poor, they, um, their, their, their knowledge is um, it's the lowest. Excellent, they have the highest level. It's a category. If you go to stress, same thing. If we use um, a validated instrument, it's going to have category to say, you don't have stress, it's moderate, it's um, high, it's ordinal. And if we use these other measures, they will give us numbers, which is a score. If you take those scores and you convert them into categories, it's now a qualitative, depending on whether maybe, yeah, it's, it's going to be maybe ordinal. It, it can also be binary where it's yes or no or it's whether you are stressed or not it can also be classified as stressed not stressed if it's stressed not stressed it's still a group yes it's still a type one type is stressed the other type not stressed but it's it's not gonna have um the the ordinal because it's just stressed not stressed it's binary and then i think uh, even the same with this poverty if you use subjective it's ordinal because they will tell you whether they are not poor, very poor, not poor, um, middle level poor, another level poor, high level poor, there will be an order. If it's poverty lines, it's going to also be a category as I showed you that um, it will be you are poor or you are not poor, depending whether you are above or below the line. Then the last one, you two have options. It can be a score. You can convert the score to poor, depending on whether they, they, they are above the 33% or below the 33%. And the age in years, if you use it as a number, it's numeric. If you use it as um, generations, it's ordinal age. It's numeric, it's going to be um, a ratio. So just to close this one, so we've spoken about, yeah, 
you need to list the variables and the variables that you've listed will um, inform what you need to collect and how because you would have explained everything as I've, I've taken you through that, that you outline um, and the indicators and the roles, whether this variable is a, the outcome, what you are primarily interested in, whether it's independent, the information or the factors that we want to use to explain the dependent variable, or whether it's other factors that we are not interested in, but we want to control for, we know that they influence the outcome. So if, for example, your study is about um, uh, if weight loss, for example, you know that gender influences weight loss because uh, um, the, our, uh, uh, the, 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 the biological composition is not the same. Our metabolic rate is not, is not the same. Then you're not interested in gender, but you are going to collect it so that you can control for those effects so that um, you can ensure that what you are seeing, if you are comparing people who are on a weight loss journey and the other ones, you give them this uh, treatment, the other one, maybe they don't go on a treatment. So you give them a placebo and the other ones, you give them something for the weight loss and you compare the two. And you also collect gender. In your model, you will also put gender so that you can control for it. You are not interested in it, but you want to ensure that when you see differences, they are not because of gender, but they're actually because of the treatment. So you can see that um, this process requires you to actually have knowledge about this subject. And the knowledge you can, Maybe sometimes you already have it because maybe you've been working in the field for quite a long time. In most cases, it will take you back to your literature review to go back to say, this is what I want to measure. How has it been measured? How do I want to measure it for my study? Is there an existing measurement? If there is no existing measurement, then you have to um, come up with a measurement and you have to have a justification. When I say justification, even if you don't show me, but for yourself, you need to, next to the questions, when you come up with questions, you must put the source in your working document. You must always put a source so that even yourself, when you look at a question, you can always say, this is where I got, or this is a new instrument, but how I arrived at this question, the influence was from this author. And you can always account, and the account is, using uh, the literature. And then these variables that you want to collect and how you want to use them will also now um, inform the kind of um, channel you can use to collect the data. Because you want to show that something causes something, then you need to have a proper experiment. So in meaning when you are designing your study, you will have to ensure that you tick all the boxes for an experiment because you want to show that something causes this. Because you don't want to show a cause, but you want to also, you just want to show how things are related. You can have an observational study, right? Uh, whether it's cross-sectional or whether it's longitudinal. You can know that, OK, I'm going to use questionnaires. Questionnaires will work uh, if it's uh, interviews, if it's quality. And you can also use uh, secondary data in the form of documents where you will extract information, the variables that you want to measure. You know that in this documents, they are captured there. And you actually know how they are captured because you went to look at the document and you you looked at it and as you put them in your plan, you even aware of how they are captured in those reports. It doesn't surprise you at the end that you wanted uh, in this report, you wanted to extract this variable, but now it's captured a different way than what you had in mind. But because you planned, you also engaged with these documents. And also we spoke about if you're collecting data from a database. So this is a summary. 
to say we have two uh, main type, nominal, ordinal, on the other side, interval ratio. We can all label them. Nominal, it's just a, a type. There is no order. Ordinal, it's a type, but there is order. And then on the right hand side, we have um, order because if someone weighs 82.4 and the other person weighs 64, you can order. Same as um, the, uh, uh, um, the interval and the ratio, you can order. And then the last part is that with interval, one of the key attributes of interval, you, you can see that you don't have it with um, any of the ordinal um, um, levels is that the, the intervals have got the same interpretation throughout. And I showed you what that means. And then with the interval, you can only add and subtract. With a ratio, you can do subtract. You can talk about twice as, as old or twice as, yeah, twice as old. And then this has a true zero. So I'm going to ask you to, um, I think I'm going to pause here, uh, Dr. Kininza. Thank you, Dr. Kininza. I'm going to um, continue. It's 10.10 10 on my side. So we have uh, 30 responses. Thank you to everyone who has participated and those of you who are doing the last beat. So the first question was the number of postgraduate students at UNISA. So it's a count. So we are counting. So once it's a count, it's going to give us a discrete, a whole number. So the number of students, you can never have um, 1,000 and a half. So it's a discrete. Most of you said discrete. And then the next one was saying a test score. A test score, we already know that it's a number, right? A, a test score does not necessarily have to be, um, maybe because I used the score, but it can have a comma, it can be rounded, it can have a comma, and it can be rounded. So it's not going to be a discrete, it's not a count. Uh, it's not a count, it's, it's a score. So we exclude we exclude that it's it's ordinal because it's a number, right? Ordinal and nominal they talk about types. They they don't give us numbers. They give us the different types. So we are able to say I have so many of these types, so many of and a percentage. So with regards to number two. You can get a score of zero, right? And a score of zero has meaning. It means that you didn't get anything. It's got meaning. So there is a true zero. So for those of you who said ratio, you are correct. So number one, you must first establish, is it a number or is it a type? Once you say it's a number, you exclude ordinal, you exclude nominal. Then you must ask yourself, what kind of a number is it? And then you'll be able to say, is it discrete? Is it ratio? Here we didn't put, is it interval? And then we talk about um, a shoe size. What can we say? About shoe size. Um, uh, this one, it was supposed to be shoe size. You have, um, because shoe sizes, shoe sizes, you have, um, how can I put it? You don't have a thousand shoe sizes. Uh, shoe sizes, you can have uh, uh, from this to that. You, you, like you don't have an infinite number of possibilities when it comes to, to 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 shoe sizes. It's not a count because you don't you 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 can't count. You can't say um, 
uh, I have. So it depending on if we capture it as uh, and shoe size can be captured as um, a comma because we know sometimes you can have seven and a half, two and a half in 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 other cases. It was actually supposed to be none of the above because um, you can have a zero shoe size. You agree, right? Zero doesn't mean that the person, the, the attribute is not there. You can have a shoe size of zero. If you look at, uh, because there was no range here, you can have a shoe size of zero. So with this particular one, uh, it's supposed to be interval because in this case, a zero doesn't mean that uh, the attributes is not there. So, um, and if we um, if we look at it as a whole number, if we talk about whole number, maybe someone could say we can have it as ordinal. That could be a possibility to have it as ordinal, because you can have, um, as I've said, categories, as in you can have size 10, 11, 12, there is somewhere where it's going to end, right? Because uh, there is a cap, a limit, and then you can have those types of shoe sizes. And then because uh, they, they, then there will be an order. So you can look at it as ordinal. But shoe size, if it's zero, it doesn't mean the size is not there. And then your year of birth, your year of birth, most of say, of you said um, it's um, it's ordinal. If you put uh, 1986, the thing with 1986, in actual fact, when you analyze it, the the system will see it as um, as an age. The system will be able to take that year of birth and actually give you um, an age. And also with this one, so I'm giving you the different possibilities. So once you see it as an age, it, it becomes what it can be continuous, right? And then with the with also the year of birth, it will depend. If, for example, you are talking about children under a certain um, category, maybe children under five. If you have like a range, you only have you don't have an infinite number of possibilities, so it can become a category if you have a range, and then uh, it, if you treat it as a category, it's gonna be ordinal. And if you treat it as um, you can, if you treat it as uh, as I say, the computer when you put it in. It can uh, be interpreted as age. It will read the year and using the year that has been used for that particular package, it's able to extract an age from the year. Then in that in that case, you see it as as age and then it becomes um, continuous. And depending on how you look at it, if someone says zero, then it means the person uh, it doesn't mean the age is not there, so it becomes um, interval because if you, you the year is zero, we can't really say the age is not there. It's just not maybe a year yet. And then I think the other ones are straightforward. Country of birth, I must move. It's a category, it's a type. So at least there it's a type. Type, it's a type. Then you must ask yourself, does this type have order? It doesn't have order, right? So it's none of the above. Because a, a country, South Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Ghana, there is no order. It's a type without an order. So none of the above. And then postal code, it's a code, right? It's just a code. You can't say this code comes before the other code, unless you are using a criteria to arrange them, then maybe they will have an order. But as a postal code, 
it's just a type. It's a type. Then it becomes nominal because it doesn't have order. Income, I think we were supposed to get this one because income is a number. I N twenty dollars. It's a number or twenty point five dollars. It's a number. The income. It's not the income category, but it's an income. And I can N zero, so it becomes what a ratio. Number of years of employment is the same as um is the same as age. And then the last one, type of car is a type and it doesn't have order. And then the last one was asking which uh, scale has a true zero point. None of the above is correct because it's supposed to be a ratio. Thank you very much. I hope this uh, was of us. Uh, assistance in terms of just engaging um, the content. I'm going to continue now with the presentation. And I have to move. So we've looked at the yes, so now I'm going to move into data analysis. And in terms of data analysis, we have different ways of analyzing data. The first level is the descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics are about the data that you have collected. So that has to be very clear that when you do descriptive statistics, you are describing the data you have collected, whatever that data represents. Descriptive statistics are not about the population, but are about the data that you have collected. If it's sample, then you are describing the sample using the people who have responded. So that's what you are describing. It's summaries. So you have many variables that you are collecting data for. So for each variable, you do what? You summarize it. And how you summarize it will depend on the type. That's where the type comes in. You are describing. And we are just really interested in important basic features because if I've collected data from all of you, I can't talk about everyone's age. I have to find a way to summarize your age. If I want to describe the people who are attending here in terms of age, I have to find a way to describe you in terms of age. Then I will use an average because age is a, um, it's a number. And you can also do the describing graphically. So in terms of um, what we looked at, if your data is categorical or qualitative, then how you summarize it, we count the different types. As I've said, you count. So when you summarize it, you are in, interested in the different types. Then you give a count to say so many people have brown hair, so many have got green, so many have got blonde. And then you also compute what? A percentage. And then you can also use cumulative percentage. Cumulative percentage, you use it if your variable is ordinal, if there is order. You don't have to use it. You use it if there are specific categories you want to accumulate over. To accumulate is to add up. So if, for example, your variable is level of education and you have using the South African classification below metric, metric, a diploma degree, Maybe you have um, a postgraduate a diploma, you have BTEC, honors, maybe you've put them in as one thing, you have masters, you have PhD, then you can accumulate, right? And if you accumulate, it means you take those with um, um, below metric, those with metric, and those with uh, a three year qualification. And then you can accumulate by that group to say 20% of my respondents um, do not have uh, a qualification beyond a three-year degree or a three-year diploma. So that one you use it if you want to add up groups and you can only add up groups if they are ordered. That's why here we say it's only relevant for ordinal data. And you only put it in the table in terms of your output. Yes, when you do SPSS, it's going to give it to you 
but if you are not using it, you don't have to put it in your table. And you see in most of my table shells, I didn't put it. On the other side, if your, uh, your variable is a numerical uh, quantitative, then because it's a number, we can add things up. You can do the mean, the median, the mode. The mode you can also do even for the categories because if you look at uh, the, the frequencies, the count, the one, that category that has uh, the most, the highest count, it can be, it's the, the most uh, occurring um, a category, but you can't have a mean for a category. You can't have um, a, a median for a category. It's not a number. And then you can also now extend it. So I think what is important here is for you to distinguish as to whether this variable is a number or is a, a category or it's qualitative. Once you say it's a type, then you know that I am not looking at the mean and everything that is associated with the mean falls off. And if I say this variable is a number, then it means I can summarize it as a num as a um, using uh, the mean, the median, the mode. I'm not going to go into the difference, but because the idea here is for you to see uh, the distinction and know that this one, because you, it's not a number, you can add up, you exclude the right hand side. And if it's a number, you can always group it. Like if it's age, you can come to the left but you can't move from the left to the right. But you, in from the left, you can take a number and make it a, a, a grouping. So then I'm going to move on to inferential um, statistics. This is how you summarize your variables. And you can summarize them one, one, or you can summarize them um, as, as, as a bivariate, where maybe you in your table, you've got two variables and you do a cross tab or you summarize them individually. And then that is descriptive. It's just describing, as I've said, and it's not describing your population. It's describing um, the people who responded. So even in your writing, um, you need to use the right words because it's not about the, uh, the population. It's about the people who have responded to your whatever, uh, where you've collected your data. Then when we move on to inferential statistics, we are now interested in the population because when you do a study, you are interested in a particular population. You want to um, you want to measure something that is occurring in a population. You are not interested in the sample. You are interested in the population, and then you will use your population, the sample, as a means to the population. We assume the sample is representative. So what we want is to take what we are observing from the sample and paste it on the population and make inferences. When we talk about inferential statistics, first part, we describe the data that we have collected. It's got nothing to do with the population. The second part, if you do have those um, research questions which require inferential statistics, then it means that what you are interested in is you want to something that you've measured from the, uh, that you want to measure something in the population, you are using the sample and you have some hypothesis that you want to test. Whatever results you want to paste them what? On the population. And then further to that, you have a population in the population, we have parameters. That's what you are interested in. You are interested in the population average, the population proportion. But now you, you are using the sample as a means to estimate what is in the population. And then what you estimate from the sample, you will call it a statistic. Then you will have a sample mean and these other things that are indicated. So you have population, sample you are interested in the population you use the sample to get to the population and what you are measuring from the sample we call them statistic and what is in the population is called a population parameter so in inferential statistics we want to make generalizations about the population by studying 
the sample. Or maybe we want to also make future predictions by studying a sample. It's important to know it's a sample, so there will be variability. And it's a sample. If I select one sample from what they say, one population, if I come back and I select again, if I'm using uh, random sampling techniques, I will come back with a different sample. So everything is based on the sample. So in terms of inferential statistics, you can be interested in univariate, meaning there is you have hypothesis about one variable. You can be interested in bivariate, meaning that your hypothesis concerns two variables. And I skipped um, the other one uh, where we analyze um, multiple variables. So your hypothesis, they concern more than uh, two variables. And then multivariate, as I have said, is when you have um, more than one um, outcome, one dependent that you want to look at those dependent as a set because you also assumed as they are dependent, they, they operate uh, together. So in terms of the, the, the tests that are there, if you have one variable, you have to check is the variable numeric or is it categorical? If it's numeric, then you can te use tests that are about the mean, which will be the one sample t test. And then there are also assumptions there. We won't talk about the assumptions. In your data analysis plan, you can put the plan as if, unless you know the variable, how it behaves, that this variable is very skewed and it's analyzed using non-parametric techniques. If you don't know, if it's numeric, it's one group, you can say, I'm going to use a one sample T test. And if it's categorical, categorical has no parametric uh, assumptions, then you will use one group. If you know that this variable is skewed, then you can use a non-parametric one-group test. But once you see numeric, you must think averages. And then if you have two variables, you need to look at those variables to see um, if you have two variables, you have to look at those variables. So here it will now depend on whether one is categorical, one is um, is numeric, and which one is dependent, which one is independent. If your dependent is numeric, like if you are interested in weight, and maybe you are comparing weight for two people who are maybe weight loss, who are on different programs as I've used before, your dependent variable is, is going to be weight and you want to see if it's influenced by the treatment. So the, the weight loss, you want to see if it's influenced by the treatment. And if this continues, so the assumptions are always about the numeric variable. So in terms of parametric or non-parametric, if this numeric variable is um, meets the assumptions, then you will uh, use parametric techniques. Then you have a categorical variable. This categorical variable, um, when we talk about t-test, it must have two levels. So this categorical variable has two groups. If it's got two groups and those two groups are independent, like the people that you are giving this treatment are different to the people that you are giving the other treatment. We say those are two sub independent groups. Then we use, a, if they're independent, you use a independent sample t-test. And if those two groups are dependent, then you use a paired t-test. And if this categorical variable has got more than two levels or more than two categories, then you use what? An ANOVA. And then the type of ANOVA you use will depend on whether the groups are dependent or independent. If I go back to my example of three of two, uh, exercise program or weight loss program. If now they are no longer two and they are three, I have more than two groups, then I will use an ANOVA because the people who are on this weight loss program are different to the ones who are not on any program and to the ones who are on another program. They are different. But there are other cases whereby you say 
you give people a, a treatment, you measure, right? That's when we mean by dependent. You give them a treatment, you measure, and then you give them a treatment after. It's the same people. So we say the, the data becomes dependent. Those two groups are dependent. That's where we have a paired T test. And then you just have the flip side of what I've shown. The only difference there is that this numeric variable, when you check, it is non parametric, but everything else is the same. The only thing that takes you to this flip side, the non parametric side, is that uh, the numeric variable, when you checked, it was not uh, symmetric or parametric. So everything that I touched on, it's the same. It's just a non-parametric version. And then you can have it. So the previous case, I had two variables. One was categorical, one was uh, continuous. Here, yeah, I still have two um, variables, but they are both numeric. So if I have two variables and they are both numeric, and they, because they are numeric, I have to look, I check the assumptions about their distribution, whether it's symmetric, not symmetric. If the assumptions of symmetric is met, then I go the parametric route. There I will be looking at a correlation. And if there I, the assumptions are not met, I will use the Spearman's rank correlation. So as I say, when you do your plan, you can assume that um, the data is parametric and you use the parametric pairs when you put it, and then when we test hypothesis, we can also change it to the other side to say, instead of this, what you proposed, we will use the, the non-parametric version. And then we have another case, it's still two variables, but now the two variables are both categorical. So we've looked at two variables, one was numeric, other categorical. Then we looked at two variables which were both um, numeric. And then now we look at two variables and they are both categorical. Categorical variables don't have assumptions about uh, them being pa parametric. They are not numbers. So they will be non-parametric. If those two groups, it's maybe um, a group of uh, children who are malnourished and another group of children who are on the other side not malnourished. So it's two groups of people, I mean of children. The people in this group are not the same as in that group. We say it's independent. If you find that you take the same children, you measure something, you measure their IQ, or and then you put them through an intervention and you measure the IQ after, it's the same uh, children, but here I used IQ. IQ is a number, so it's not um, a right variable for this one. If let's say you are measuring uh, something that is a category, so maybe you are measuring stress level, right? You measure the stress level before you give them an intervention and you measure the stress level after. So if the stress level is categories, then you will say that data is dependent because it's the same sharing before and after. You use the test at the bottom, the McNema. But if those two groups um, are independent, as I use the group of the children who are malnourished, and the other group is those who, are, who have normal, uh, um, good nutrition, they're not malnourished. It's two groups of children, those who are in the malnourished or undernourished, it's, it's, they're different to those who are in the group of uh, normal. So that would be independent and you can use the Pearson's chi-square test. And if you are looking for something that a trend analysis, but your data has categories, then you can use the goodness of fit. So what I've covered here, we started with when you have one, one variable, and if it's a numeric, we go for the test that talk about the mean. If it's not numeric, we go for the test that talk about proportions uh, computed from percentages. Then we have two variables, one categorical, 
one numeric. Then we have two variables, both numeric. We have the correlation coefficient, parametric, non-parametric. Categorical data is non-parametric. It will depend now because it's two groups. It's groups. It's not necessarily two groups, but it's groups. It will depend on these groups whether they're independent or dependent. And then you can also have two variables and analyze it as a regression where with a correlation uh, coefficient, uh, as we I showed you correlation, it just looks at the correlation as to whether these variables, when this variable increases, what happens to the other variable? When you use a regression, you are actually able to quantify the effect to say, uh, when this variable increases by a unit increase, by a unit, what happens to my outcome? When the dependent variable increases by a unit, so when we do regression, we talk about a unit increase. So when my independent variable increases by a unit, when the temperature increases by a unit, what happens to the amount, the sales? of ice cream. With the correlation, I'm only able to say there's a strong correlation between ice cream sales and um, temperature. But with the regression, I'm able to say when, it, when temperature increases by a unit, this is what happens to ice cream sales. So even if I have two variables, I can use a regression so that I can be able to get the uh, uh, the effect of that unit increase. In the correlation case, I'm only able to say those two variables are strongly or they are correlated to each other, but I'm not able to say any further. And then we can also have um, one numeric variable and have more than one uh, categorical independent variable. So if I go back to the example I used about plants, where I can give the plants, um, what do they call it? Plant food. And I can give it different concentrations. So that would be my, my one independent variable would be uh, the concentrations, right? And maybe I can also add another variable, which can be maybe light. I expose them to different uh, levels of light. So I now have more than one categorical independent variable. One is the concentration level with different levels. Then I have another categorical variable independent. I want to see when I vary it, what happens to this outcome? What happens to the growth of this plant? Then I also add another variable. When I have one variable, if it's three lev more than two levels, I use an ANOVA. But once I have more than um, one categorical independent variable, then I look at a multi-way ANOVA. It can be two-way, three-way, depending on the number of the categorical independent variables. And then we going back to regression. So here you can see it's multiple variable analysis. So the outcome, as I said, is still one. It's just that on the right-hand side, you have many um, uh, independent variables. And some of these variables, they, I mean, these techniques, they take you back. For example, if you do an ANOVA, ANOVA is when you have three groups, three or more groups, and you have one numeric and three or more groups. If you do an ANOVA with two groups, it will just um, uh, become a t-test. So you can still put it there, but it will just give you a t-test. Some uh, systems will not allow it because it will be expecting you to specify, it will be expecting a variable with more than uh, three levels. But some uh, softwares, it allows you to do the ANOVA, but the results are identical to the t-test because it is in essence a t-test. So even with regression, um, some regression analysis, they will um, actually essentially give you the results of an ANOVA. 
So here you have one outcome, and then you have many independent variables. This outcome must be numeric. It has to be a uh, numeric. And then if the assumptions of the distribution are met, it's multiple linear. Otherwise, it's a non-parametric regression. And then we also have uncover, whereby you have one outcome which is numeric, but you have a, a categorical variable that you want to adjust for. So I use the example of when you're doing weight loss, when you do things for pre and post. So for example, with weight loss, you might want to adjust for the initial um, uh, the initial um, weight loss. So you want you might want to adjust because not the initial weight loss, the initial weight. Because if I start the program and I I weigh uh, quite a lot, maybe my body is going to respond different to someone who starts the program and they don't weigh that much. So I want to take into account the initial weight so I can do an uncover where my outcome it's numeric and I have two groups. But now I have um, this variable that I want to account for instead of just looking at the treatment and the outcome. I look at the treatment, the outcome, but I also adjust for the initial weight. So when I say the people who were on this treatment, I compare them treatment B and treatment C if I, I have three treatments. But now I want to adjust for the initial weight because I know that the initial weight can influence the outcome, how you respond and the weight loss that we record. So you can adjust for that, that's an uncover. And then we can also have an outcome that is categorical. So when we were doing the regression, I was talking about an outcome that is numeric. So now we have an outcome that is categorical. And then on the right hand side, we can have some independent variables. So if the outcome has two groups, which is yes, no, pass, fail, then we say it's binary regression. If it's got more than two groups, then we say it is um, multinomial. And then we now have to check whether it's got order or it doesn't have order. If it's got order, it's going to be ordinal. So you can even see ordinal order. And you can have order when we have more than two groups. And then multinomial, it's when it's just more than two categories, but they don't have any order. And then we can have multivariate techniques. So multivariate techniques, I'm not going to expand on them, but I've listed them. You will see if you have, with multivariate techniques, you have um, many variables that you are looking at at the same time. That's one of the, uh, uh, um, the things that you are analyzing at the same time. So these are the, uh, the some examples of uh, multivariate. I want us to go to the, the example for the data analysis plan. I thought I had it open, but yeah. So in practice, so this I have this um, example that I, I want to take you through. If we go back to the slides, maybe let's start with the slides. This is a summary of what we've covered, but maybe I've put it in a different way. So maybe when you go through it, it will make better sense than um, the way I presented it the first time. So I have this case that I want us to look at so that we can do the data analysis plan. With this case, um, I get I got it from this article. So it's a South African study 
by these authors, they are looking at um, a teenage pregnancy. I actually had the thing open. Yes, they are looking at teenage pregnancy because I want to read it from there. Just a little bit, yes. I want to show you a little bit. So here it's easy because I'm taking it from the article has been published, but there will be lessons from this article. So they looked at uh, adolescent pregnancy occurring in girls aged 10 to 19 years. Okay, that's a background. But what they are targeting, they are targeting uh, people between the ages of 18 to 24 years. It was a household survey. So they are doing a household survey. This is the sample. So this is the target. So when they get to the household, they are not interested in everyone, but they're interested in this. And they are looking at uh, males and females. In terms of if you are female, they want to know if you, um, you are pregnant while in this age group. And if you are a male, they're looking at whether you impregnated someone. So males and females, even though it's about but um, adolescent pregnancy, they are looking at both males and females. For the females, it's whether you fell pregnant while in that age. And then for the males, they are looking at whether you impregnated someone. It's a cross-sectional study. And then if you look at the article, so it will motivate, it brings out the, the variables. Um, the, the dependent variables. So they discuss the dependent variables that are linked to uh, a pregnancy at this age. And all those variables, they are going to, to measure the ones that they are putting across. And then if we just come back now to, I hope you it will move. So here there is the prevalence. That's the, what they are looking at. The proportion of males who impregnated impregnated teenagers. So you must have impregnated a teenager, and then they're looking at the factors. So these are the specific. So here they are captured in terms of objectives. So uh, factors associated with teenage pregnancy, factors associated with male teenagers impregnating um, teenagers. So you must have been a teenager you look back as to when you were a teenager, did you impregnate a, a teenager? And then, so the inclusion criteria is there, and then there is the outcome that is a given, the binary, it's, a, it's yes or no. You fall, did you fall pregnant in the reference period? And then there is another one, as to whether you impregnated um, a teenager, if you are a, a male. And then these are the independent variables. So I've put some of the, the, there are some individual variables. They look at your knowledge about contraceptives. They measure self-esteem, sense of future, and all these variables they explain how they are measured and then there are other variables which are like social variables, peer pressure, attitude to sex and then there are structural variables which are like poverty, uh, formal education, access to certain things. So if you were, you had these objectives, you had the objectives and you wanted to do a study like that, as I've said, you have to look at your objectives as you have put them. And based on those objectives, you'll have to now go back at the, um, the dependent, the independent variable. You have to identify the concepts, right, that are being picked up. And then those concepts, are they coming into play as dependent or as independent variables? So the dependent variables, then you have to go back to your literature and see how those dependent variables have been measured uh, previously. Even the independent variables, you have to look at what how they've been measured uh, previously. So you will put your your variables. You have a table like this one. 
I skipped the part of the, the objectives, but you need to have a column where you will add the objectives and the objectives, you will line them up next to the variables that are talking to that particular objective. And then you have your dependent variable, it's called pregnancy. It doesn't have, it's just pregnancy. And then it's relevant for both. And then you write the, the type that it's going to be a yes or no. Then you already know your outcome variable, it's binary. It means that when you think analysis, you must think analysis that is going to talk to a binary outcome. And then here are some of your independent variables. One variable was knowledge about contraceptives. And very important, so this knowledge, you must now tell us how you are going to measure it. If you have questions that you are using, if you are using an existing instrument, make sure that you open it. And also you must check what the reliability that has been reported so that you know that this instrument, when you read articles, there is it's reliable because for example if i just come back to the article if you look at some of the measures uh, we will come to them but if you look at some of this where they say measures so they explain how everything has been measured but they are not listing all the questions for each variable they sometimes just give you examples if i pick up one oh uh, one, the one where, yeah, for example, here they say self esteem. Self esteem is one of the indi uh, uh, independent variables, and they are using this scale, this item scale that they are referring to. And the Cronbach Alpha is 0 0.64. So you have to go, which is below the ideal cutoff point of 0 0.7. So you have to go to the scale check. Will you be able to have access to this scale? Is it a scale that is freely available or do you have to pay for it? So you, you before you go ahead and say, I'm going to use this, you write to the authors if you can't find it and you request for it and you get permission and you look at it and you also see if it will actually work because in the article, you don't see all the questions. They just give you an idea that it's using this and sometimes with some of these questionnaires when you look at the, you check and you try to um get them you find that um you actually have to request it from the owner so some of these are some of the things that you need to be aware of i wanted to hear what brought us here was this alpha that for example sense of future they say i have a plan for the future so they are not giving you all these six items, but they're giving you an idea of how the kind of questions they were asking to measure this sense of future. If you have a variable like sense of future and you want to adopt their measurements, you'll actually now have to request them to give you a list of these uh, variables. Maybe they to give you the entire questionnaire so that you can see all these variables. And you can look at the alpha is 0 0.63 and see how this sense of this measurement of sense of future, how much it has been used uh, previously and what has been the alpha. And if you find that in most studies, the alpha was good, maybe it was just in this study that the alpha was low. But if you find that um, there is a, you know, you're getting mixed, then you maybe you can decide that you want to use it, but you will change it. Um, a little bit maybe you, you when you look at the questions you might be able to say maybe this question is the one that is contributing to this alpha that is not um within the required or above the required cutoff point so going back to our document so you put all the variables you can see it explains if you say knowledge they explain how knowledge was measured that's what you have to do and list the questions and if it's a like a, an instrument tell us once you have asked people 15 questions how do you use those questions do you compute an index 
do you compute something that is a composite score? Do all the questions have equal weight? Those things are important and they have to be outlined here. And then you even say that, for example, self-esteem with this instrument, once you've asked them these 14 questions, then you compute a score. And then if it's below, uh, for if it's less than 15, they say you have um, low esteem. And if it's 15 and above, they will say you have good esteem. Those are the things because what you, if you pick up is you'll find that the researcher has many questions and then you ask, how are you going to use these questions together to come to a conclusion to say whether this person, they will say if they answer mostly positive, but what is mostly? Is it 10? Is it 12? And what is positive? So everything has to be very specific to say, this is how I score it and you write it so that come data analysis, you just use your document and you can actually, because you are planning, you'll be able to um, deal with some of the things that you think might not work. So these are the variables you see, I've listed them. And on the right hand side, yes, at the end, because I've given you an example at the beginning. So you'll have to continue with every variable. The last column must tell us whether it's, if it's binary, you know it's a category. If it's a, a, a score, you can put there, it's a score. And if it's um, nominal or if it's ordinal, you can put it's ordinal. And you write it there. And then based on knowing that my outcome is, and here at the end, I also have some variables which are just background variables that you maybe want to use to describe the data. And there are some many other variables, but important thing is with every variable you describe, you provide also the type at the end. And then after you have done this, because you know your outcome, if you have one outcome, if you have many outcomes, you know your outcomes, then you create the shell tables. So for all your categorical variables, you create this, you know, you list all your categorical variables. I hope you can see. And you already know this is what I'm going to have in my document. And if you, there are some variables here, you like know what is it doing here. You can see it now here and you can see what's not here. And you can add because you can see it. It's not just in the mind because you see it, it's written. You are able to engage it and actually analyze it and say, is this really what I want? or not. But what I also like is also you are aware how your data is going to be summarized. So this is just the descriptives. And for your numeric variables, you also put if you want more, I just use the mean, the SD. In your mind, you already see, OK, this is what I'm going to be getting. No, it's not what I want. I don't want this knowledge as an average. I want it as a category, whatever, or this age. I don't want the mean. I want the generations for my study. Then you take it out of here, you put it in the other side, and then you go to your bivariate analysis. And you look at the variables that you, so for example, you want to look at whether knowledge, there's a difference, whether, um, uh, the uh, uh, the knowledge is affected by um, whether being pregnant or not has a relationship with your knowledge, right? And then you'll be able to to say, okay, knowledge is um, is a number, meaning I'm expecting averages, and I'm comparing the averages between those who are pregnant and those who are not pregnant. Those who are pregnant. Do they have less knowledge than those who are, uh, uh, who didn't fall pregnant? That could be a bivariate, uh, 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 something you are interested in. And you know, okay, I have a knowledge and I have this. Then you can uh, put a table like this one. And then you can have another interest where it's still, 
you want to know whether your networks, your social networks, social networks was talking about um, relatives, uh, parents that you can actually talk to. And you want to know if people who have this influence of social networks, is there a relationship with the outcome? And then you know, network, this social is, if I go back to my table, it's a category. Pregnancy, it's a category. I need to look for a test that looks at two categories. Then you can check, you can even Google statistical test that looks at two categories. Then it's gonna be a chi-squared test. And then you know, this is what you're expecting. It's percentages. If you don't, it's not what you want, how you want it to things to appear, then you can think about it and maybe measure this social networks maybe in a different way. And then if we take it a next level to your multiple variable analysis, we've already said the outcome pregnant is binary, yes or no. Then it means you use logistic regression. And then you can put, you can look at uh, articles that have uh, used logistic regression and see what they put in the table or in the results. And you know that's what you're going to have so you can, and then you put your variables. So you might not know, like when it comes to the data analysis, now the actual statistical test, you might not really know how they work, but you have an idea. Even when you read, you know what to read about because you know your outcome, you know your um, depend independent variables. So this is how you do your shell tables. And you can say, no, that's not what I want. I don't want this. And then because you don't want this, you can make changes because you are still at a planning stage and you can and then try something else. And then until you have what you think is actually what you you've conceived in your mind, or it could be that what you want, you are not able to get and then you change it. Maybe you are not able to measure that variable and then you change it and look for a proxy. So I hope this was helpful um, and I hope you will use this kind of a format when you, you approach your, your variables. The data analysis, I am not usually very, uh, very hard if let's say you are not really sure because I mean statistics is statistics. It, if you, you are really new, uh, it might not be easy even if you know your variables, but knowing your variables is very important. Knowing your variables is very important because you know, and the scales of measurement is important because you know that I want to talk about averages, but I won't be able to talk about averages because my variable is this way. Let me change it so that I can talk about, because that's what you are conceiving in your mind. Oh, I want to talk about averages, but no, these instruments, they categorize. So maybe let me relook at it. And then you change and you say, I'm going to look at it in terms of the categories. So you are able to, to plan up until you get to something that you can uh, uh, work with. I suppose maybe the stats part we will still cover and unpack because we will have workshops where we look at the tests in detail. Here I was just mentioning them so that maybe some of them you probably um, get, others you might not get, but you can see how everything fits together. I'm going to pause here, uh, Dr. Kininza, and I think you can, uh, I've put some practice things for you there that you can use actually to, it's going to give you some variables and try to explain them, and then it will ask you which tests can you perform. And I think from these examples, it might, they will also assist you to uh, see if there are some things that are similar to your study, some of the examples, and you can see, okay, when I have something like this, I can use this test. So there is like maybe three or four examples that you can look at. I hope they will also assist you as you do a data analysis plan. Thank you very much.